Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in today. Um, I'm very excited to be speaking with Eve Anecker, who is a Bertha Fellow exploring the art and power of retreat. Eve is also an ecologist, a teacher and a writer. And this month, Eco Resolution has been exploring our relationship with nature and perhaps how our psychological split um, and the separation between our lives and the natural world might be at the root and the heart of our climate and ecological crisis. Um, Eve, it's such a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Thank you for joining us. Um, could you start by telling me a little bit about the work that you do and, and where your passions lie? Um, I briefly mentioned at the beginning that you were an ecologist. Um, could you explain what that means? <laughs> Firstly, it's wonderful to be with you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and yes, I think the great thing about the world, the word ecology is it's like everybody knows from the Greek oikos, meaning household, earth's household. And so I guess an old style way of looking at what an ecologist might be would be to be very focused on the environment. And I think other ways of seeing that now are much clearer about the complexities of relationship relationship with each other, with the more than human world, and including in that the extraordinary uncolonized space of connecting with nature. And I guess that's been most of my work for the last 30 or 40 years, particularly in South Africa. Um, if you like, I can just describe that a little bit. Shall I do yeah. that? Yeah, mm. that'd be lovely. Thank you, Eve. Mm. Um, the, the heart of my work over the last two decades has been creating, um, creating place, really, the first mixed income eco village in South Africa as a post apartheid um, exploration into what would it mean to live in a country differently, a country with the, the travesty and notorious history that South Africa has. Um, instead of being able to create great policy and figure implementing it, um, we saw our task as literally just like everybody else, wanting to make a bit of a better world. And that for us meant working with the poorest of the poor in amongst a farm area to imagine how it would be to be able to live in some sense of justice where not only did we live as neighbors with the most amazing people from um, local surrounds, but also to live in a way that was lighter, where we recycled 100% of our water and in a drought-stricken country, that's a big deal. Where we started beginning to grow our own food, and nobody can live on the food that we grow only because we would starve for sure. But to begin, what it would be like to connect with indigenous plantings, to um, use renewable energy to make our hot water, and also to build using appropriate materials. And as a, I think as a place calls us, it brings with it all its challenges. And so the myths and the stories of the place start um, playing out as we, we become what, what the earth is literally calling for. And so for us, that also meant starting with children, working with the tiniest of humans and helping make a, a Montessori preschool and then primary school, and also a degree with the Stellenbosch University, where the students would come to this institute. And the institute's called the Sustainability Institute. And instead of going to main campus and being taught in very conventional ways, I think the real thing when you talk about a connection with nature might be how we learn in different ways. Yeah. Yeah, I really, um, I really love how you're kind of describing what sounds a bit like an experiment um, 
on how we can live differently, live in more closer alignment to um, the natural world, perhaps in greater harmony. Um, so, you know, I think uh, we often feel as though what we've been handed, the kind of the way that we approach life is kind of is set. But actually, the more we look into it, it's actually a particular mindsets, particular ways of being, which have become so ingrained in us, we forget that it's actually possible to recreate um, cultures or to, to kind of evolve cultures. Um, I'd love to learn a little bit more from you about what you perceive as connecting with nature. What what does it mean to to be in relationship with the world around you and 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 what does that mean for an individual and for a community Mm. Uh, firstly the way you say it is really beautiful and i want to just acknowledge completely we are all modern in a way we are all colonized so that that being said my question is always and so what else what, what is there still room for in this extraordinary, um, in these bodies that we inhabit? In, um, and so when I imagined connecting with nature, or when I, when I do, and I try and think about speaking about it, it feels a little bit of an anathema, because often it's beyond words, or it's pre-verbal, to be able to be in the in the stillness of a strange, uh, sort of exquisite, almost an ecstasy of beauty and complexity and intricacy, not necessarily benign or only kind, nature's not, but to have a sense of connection that literally is, is beyond sometimes even beyond comprehension. So it's an experience. And I think it's triggered, uh, and I I find myself even being able to, not really finding the words to talk about it, but by a strange yearning. And when we yearn for that, which we don't quite know what it's for, as people call it spirituality or soul, and that may be so. But there's a yearning for what happens in that moment of connection. And when we can do that in wilderness, obviously one loves the parks and one loves the pathways next to the river. And one loves being in a river. I'm living in a houseboat at the moment. So the the joy of the tides and the flow. But in real wilderness, where the space to connect with the cosmos, with the stars, with um, night, and, and with the um, infinity, and an, an, an infinity of beauty and space. I think we've lost that for the most part. We can find it in pockets, but that absolute expansiveness, that spaciousness, that's also in our hearts, that's also in our bodies. I imagine that if children uh, who, who come knowing that spaciousness, if children had the chance in their learning, in their, exp- in their education, not to be spoon-fed, um, pummeled with facts, but to um, have the enchantment, the enchantment of playing, playing and playing, where there are trees, the different, many different plants. Diversity is is an experience, it's not words. That that becomes a celebration, a celebration of living. So I imagined um, that obviously those things have a long way to go, but there must be an uncolonized part of us that can't ever be colonized, an uncolonized imagination or creativity that literally forms a journey home, uh, a journey into um, the expansiveness from which, yeah, actually from which all potential comes. Mm. Mm. Yeah, 
Thank you. That's really beautiful. Um, I love what you say about a celebration of living um, and, 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 and bringing up, you know, our, like our, the colonization of, of cultures. Um, this kind of, this like ideal of what it is to be an adult in our culture is to deny yourself of the ability to play. But the ability to play is the ability to kind of interact like and engage with things in such an enchanted way where you can connect with stories and feelings. And and like you said before, you know, things which aren't just human um, and, and to derive joy from that. But in our culture, play is seen as um, as looked down upon as, as something childish. And if it's childish, it's, you know, it's based, you know, it's not, um, it's kind of anti-masculine, you know, so it kind of all plays into this kind of patriarchal society of what it is to be an adult. Um, but, but the way that we've kind of, the way that you know, our human history seems to have been going for the past, um, however, however long has been to really kind of disconnect ourselves from the ability to, to play and to engage in, in the more than human in, in a kind of enchanted way. And, and I, um, I love kind of how Sharon Blackie writes, um, we've fallen out of love or we seem to have fallen out of love with the world and it's clear from the way we treat it. Um, and I really imagine that by us being able to, um, live in a way which is in kind of closer relationship with the natural world, um, and for us to kind of really be able to acknowledge that we are part of like a, like a web of existence and and that like that's that like when we can come to understand the complexity of the natural world and how um the ecosystem we are part of that ecosystem and it completely supports us that's such an enchanted way of understanding the way our lives are in comparison to this kind of story of separation where we are separate to perhaps above the rest of the world um that's such a disenchanted way to live and it's not magical at all and yeah, I really feel that um, the journey of re-enchanting our, our lives um, isn't one of like fantasy. Um, it's one of actual like of science, just coming to understand how, you know, yeah, how, how, how beautifully complex and like interactive the world is around us. Um, I would love to know about uh, a little bit more you said before about um, creating uncolonized spaces in which we can come to connect with nature. And um, what, what do you mean by this? It, um, how can connecting to nature be something that's colonized? I, I, well, I think that's the question. That's the question. And as you were talking, I was thinking that when we come at something from a purely conceptual level, so there's ways of being with nature which could be um, beautifully scientifically described. The, the tree, its, um, its texture, it's a, a full-on description, observations carefully noted and absolutely valid. Another way of being with that same tree would be artistically, would be to draw it, to sing it a song, to um, paint it, to write it a poem. And another, yet another way to be with that tree might be to be deeply still, to literally be that being. And all of those are valid. It's just that one seems to have had so much emphasis, conceptual, rational, logical, beautiful, that some of the others have disappeared a little bit. So if I was imagining um, spaces and uh, uncolonized imaginings, those are the things I'd be looking to create for myself. And if I was with a group of children or in retreat, it's, in a sense, how that experience talks through us. And I'm not sure that that can be pre-thought or analyzed or compared or framed. I genuinely think that's a direct experience. 
and may be different for each person and they may interpret it differently. And in the space of what might be infinitely feminine that belongs in men and women, um, it goes into what you said as a kind of a, a, a laugh, a humor, a, a surprise, a mystery, and something that could be carnivalesque, not necessarily, you know, oh, we're all going to meditate at the same time, nice and, you know, um, uh, disciplined, but much more about a, a joy, a, a sense of joy. And perhaps that's what I, I imagine as that which is uncolonized, sacred, yeah, funny, real, actually just real. Yeah, that's beautiful. And, and you, you do, um, or you have been involved in a course called Becoming Indigenous at mm. the incredible Schumacher College. Yes. Um, could you tell me a little bit about this and, and why this name and, and why yeah. this course? Yeah, um, I've had a, I've, you know, celebrated Schumacher College for 27 years, I think. And in 2015, they ran the first what they called becoming indigenous. And everybody was very twitchy about the name and understandably, I mean, how can you become indigenous in the 21st century? But the journey was, what would it mean to be human in the 21st century? And so the, um, our, there wasn't a PowerPoint presentation in sight. Our, it was a four month residential space and our stories were mythologists, were storytellers, were people who lived in nature only, uh, you know, modern day witches and wizards, I would think. And, <laughs> uh, but in, in, you know, in a connected way, nothing woo woo. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it was life changing because there were parts of many of us that uh, just started waking up literally waking the sleeping mind, a mind that had been so framed, so useful, so beautiful in the world, but now seemed no longer so necessary. Um, you know, a um, teacher from the Ecuadorian Amazon, from Lakota Nation, Diné, uh, from India via Nigeria, uh, poets, uh, traditional healers. And the most important thing about it, it was not seen as um, some grand narrative, something uh, uh, holier than thou. It was messy, difficult, night work, you know, sweat lodges, um, vigils. But the kind of um, cataclysmic opening of portals and thresholds and um, quiet, quiet drama, if there's such a thing, quiet drama, I then opened a spectrum into a master's in ecology and spirituality, which we then convened for a couple of years. And from that work has developed this intrigue of understanding that our, our inner gaze, the gaze within, is what feeds in the sort of infinity sign an ability to act. And my, my kind of obsession with you and with others is the questions about what, what is home? Um, who on earth am I? And what do I do? And in these times where, where we need to sit a little bit more in this liminality of lockdown, of the, um, of, of uncertainty, of not trying to close things down too quickly. I think these are the questions that need to be asked. Actually. What do you mean by um, liminality? And also, what do you mean Thanks. about the relationship between the inner gaze and coming and, and, and action? How do those well, Liminality is the space in between, you know, where you in limbo, one isn't sure, one isn't sure this or that. Mm. And usually in the big transitions in our lives, that's the feeling that provokes the most um, Ah, it's anxiety. dreadful, anxiety, <laughs> uncomfy, yeah. not at all nice. Yeah. And yet it's a really important phase to be in. Mm. And those of us who are good control freaks hate it the most because mm. we like things to be just so. 
And um, what was the second question you asked me? Yeah, the relationship between the inner gaze uh, and yeah. coming to yeah, action. Because yeah. I'm intrigued by this because it's it um, yeah. it's making my like study of meditation mm -hmm. like start seeing it from that perspective. But I'm I'm an intrigued what you completely mean. because it brings one into the present, into mm. just now. Mm. There's no anxiety because the past isn't there and the future hasn't, and it's now. Mm. But this inner gaze, I think, is may also, I have a suspicion, be a key to for us being able to stop just repeating patterns, patterns of both our family histories, but also the patterns of patterns a little bit of our pain or our wound, so that we imagine, oh, we want to change the world. And then we hit it hammer and tongs in exactly the way that the world got to be in that mess. We do it that same way instead of perhaps from a different place, which what I'm imagining, um, our soul, our inner work, our um, connection with other might be able to give perspective. Mm. I really love that you brought up um, the word patterns um, mm -hmm. because we are such creatures of habit, aren't we? You know, mm -hmm. we can get into really healthy habits and patterns and you get into really unhealthy habits and patterns. And some of them are we do consciously and some of them we kind of fall into unconsciously. Um, but I really like thinking about patterns, um, especially from the perspective of, say, like a meditation practice, if you understand that you know that kind of inner gaze being able to watch your thoughts being able to take a step back to be able to see how you're you're acting you can start to see your the, the way the, your patterns and after quite a bit of practice you can you can see for example if you're speaking to someone and there's someone who aggravates you for whatever reason you can see how you're about to re, you know react and and you know, take that that step back but I I think that so from the personal level, but coming to understand our patterning is, is really important. So we can kind of start to refine our patterns and replace unconscious ones with conscious ones um, through daily practice and, and, and such things. But I also think thinking about it from a collective perspective, it's really empowering if we understand that the way um, our societies are kind of running right now, the way that we've kind of really made this psychological split from from nature in in order to be able to kind of have a growth-based economy and to be able to live in, in such disharmony with with the needs of, of the natural world that supported that supports us um the understanding that these are just habits and patterns they're not necessarily a part of who we are it's not like i don't believe that humans are inherently greedy or mm. are inherently stupid i just <laughs> i just think that we're kind of sometimes yeah <laughs> But I feel like we've kind of just been, we're so deeply entrenched in certain patterns and certain ways of behaving that we kind of, we think it's almost like our right to be able to consume whatever we want, to be able to extract from the earth whatever we want. But I genuinely believe that, you know, the more we start thinking about it and, and reflecting on ourselves and, and acting and then mobilizing our communities and the people around us, we can really start to gradually shift these patterns and start to replace the unconscious ones that cause harm with ones that don't cause harm to ourselves and to other people. And, and I think... Um, you know that, that I find really empowering and that that's also why I see myself as being quite conservative and not so radical often because I don't know if I genuinely would want like radical change you know everything mm. changing what I would love is for there to be a thriving people's movement where we're gradually starting to replace you know things and because life is so complex so I, I really believe that the the way we could kind of you know make a just transition to a world that thrives is through um, yeah, through looking at our, our patterns. Um, and, and actually, I'd love to talk to you about just transitions, because I know that you worked around just transitions and, mm. and you do a lot of work on justice um, mm. within sustainability. And, and I'd love for you to um, tell me a little bit about that. Well, I, I think the link I would want, uh, the link I would try and make with that is, is changing the way we do things and so you know this imagining that one can go and change one's community or organize no 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 you know that's a bit old school 
But I think there are ways that we learn to start deeply collaborating and co-creating, along with all the bumps that um, that we know that there. It's so nice to work in a in a team or a small collective where you don't have to think of everything. Of course, someone else is sure to think of it. And as you create, as you change the way that you might have done things, so, so there becomes a softness, um, a kindness, uh, perhaps just a bit more gentle. And when, you know, justice is such a contested term, who's justice? And what is just? And Perhaps as I've worked with it longer at first, I was like gung-ho and, you know, could fight for justice. That's an anathema again. But to be able to be in one's body with one's close friends, um, work people, community, building community all the time, all the time, then it somehow sinks into what Mexican folklore called the river below the river. And there's a flow that gathers. And as it gathers the momentum, it's incredibly easy. Sometimes we create these great big monsters because that our ego feels fabulous as if we're taking a sword and going off to fight and these mega dramas. I feel I have little time for that. I have infinite time for um, working, for gathering, but for a sense of alignment, of um, amazement, of what can one do literally together that you couldn't do apart. And where um, the anxiety of competition can just rest a little bit. We all have a good ego. We all have, you know, wanting to, to be something. But I think there are parts that when you think about justice genuinely, where children are held differently, where birth, is ha birth happens differently, where uh, men feel welcomed into a world that's become very focused on different kind of women. And it's such an exciting time to be alive now because I, gen I, I see the possibilities as infinite for the shifts that you talk about. But they're often invisible. They're often not, don't have to be shouted. They can be curated and cared and held. And an entire river changes its bank that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's so beautiful. And do you, do you, um, because that is such like a what what's the word I'm trying to say like feels like a re, like a soft and like sacred mm -hmm. <laughs> means of approaching change mm -hmm. making but like how do you stay in that soft space because I feel personally like I can I can be in that space mm -hmm. but then I can also be like going off to battle with like a sword so um, and it's jolly good to bring out the sword sometimes you need a good <laughs> glint of steel yeah but it's but, can, yeah no I isn't that the tension too and to live in that tension because mm. there are choices to be made it doesn't mean it's a weak position. Softness and gentleness doesn't mean weakness. And in fact, it's often the strength in that of the colleagues that I know who can, who can access that pretty much at will. It's, the, um, it's compelling. It's a compelling energy. It's not the same as a braggart or a... But it doesn't mean the sword isn't out. It's the tension that um, perhaps is it a soft soul, a, a soft soul with a strong spine, an open front with a strong, with a strong spine. I, I think those live together, Christabel. And oh, of course, you bump away and you know, like you fall into your anger. Or yeah, it's okay. It's okay. 
there's always somebody to hold or to shift or to, or you do get a bit embarrassed and feel a bit, you know, stupid. That's, I think that's great because it's a bit um, defenseless and humbling. And that's not a bad place to, to begin. If um, someone who's listening and they're, you know, the work that you do at the community level is so incredible. I mean, to, you've set up an eco village mm. Um, mm. with a community of people. Um, mm. And that's, that. Much, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's been really, really difficult at times, but like, mm. what, an inc- what an incredible thing that, that you've been able to do. Um, and also feels like there's like a deeply embedded kind of understanding of, of the, you know, the all, relate that you're in relationship with the natural living world around you um for someone who wants to like go on that path of mm. building community of, of coming into alignment with the natural world where where would you what tips would you share <laughs> <laughs> maybe not tips but like how yeah yeah like, no, it's there, a great it's a great question where where do you begin you mm. be, you, you just begin mm. and you look at what it's there because whatever, whatever, whatever you want to do, you have it all within you and you have it all within the process that you are in, the place that you're in. So um, I'd say breathe, you know, listen deeply, listen deeply. Um, you know, don't do anything like you always would have done it. Do something a bit different. Be a little bit um, open to, you know, feeling a bit of a twit. No, uh, meditate, but it doesn't have to be meditation in an uncomfy, horrid way. Gaze, <laughs> go and gaze at a tree. Some things, ah, draw. Uh, even if you're not an artist, especially if you see yourself not as an artist, go and draw. Do the things you're not used to. And pitch up, be present. And i put my head on a block that what comes to you is exactly the thing that you need to be opening yourself up to and perhaps doing. But I would, if I was thinking about starting something, which I am, I'm doing that with you and Ruby, um, it takes, it, it, it takes holding it a little bit differently and not jumping in too soon. Perhaps that's what I would say. Don't jump too soon. Take a little time. Grow, a, have, grow a plant. Go and yeah. grow something. Go and grow something. Um, watch it. And the way it becomes into the world will teach you. <laughs> I keep having, I have this, what you said earlier on, going round and round my head saying, and what else? Because mm. it's such a beautiful, um, such a beautiful, like, kind of means of looking at mm. things. Um big thing that we're doing as part of eco-resolution like one of our aims and missions is to kind of show alternative pathways to Mm -hmm. building um a world that thrives and to exactly like you say asking and what else Mm -hmm. um what are the other options how can we envision and and co-create something and be building something together Mm -hmm. um so yes so Um, do it so we do it and we learn as we do and yeah. at the same time, we reflect, we be still, and we listen for the invisible, mm-hmm. because it's always there, and that's where the coolest stuff is. Mm-hmm. But not to jump into project management and roles and organizations and structures too soon. Those are useful later on, mm-hmm. sometimes. <laughs> well, thank you, Eve, so much. Thank you. I loved it. Mm-hmm. Thank you.